Well, here we are at the last session of Retirement Plan Live, when life throws you a curveball edition. I don't know about you, but I have been blown away by the spirit of Emma and Luca as they deal with a oh, pretty hard, fast curveball they got thrown at them. I want to welcome you to the Retirement Answer Man Show. My name is Roger Whitney. This is the show dedicated to helping you not just survive retirement. We want you to rock retirement, regardless of what comes your way. Now, if you are new to the show, this is a live case study with Emma, a listener, where over the last month, this whole month of September, we have been walking through, and you've gotten to listen in, to their plan for retirement and how they're dealing with a pretty difficult situation that they were not planning for. So if you want to catch up on the series, you can go back to the first episode of this month and and do that. And a reminder, on October 10th, Thursday, we are going to have a live meeting where myself and Emma are going to be on with you, and you're going to be able to watch as we walk through what their ideal retirement is, what resources they have to marshal to make it happen how they're going to deal with some of the variables that they're having to deal with because of Luca's medical issue that he's dealing with, and brainstorm how they can maybe make uh, the best of uh, a difficult situation. So if you want to be with us live on that webinar or have access to the replay, you're going to have to be signed up for Six Shot Saturday, our weekly email on Saturday mornings. And you can get signed up for that at rogerwhitney.com right there on the homepage. And on the sidebars, you can enter your first name and your email and you'll get our Six Shot Saturday updates. And that's where we've shared all of the summaries of our sessions and also where you can register for the results meeting on October 10th at 7 p.m. So central time. So go check that out. But let's get into this last session. Uh, But before we do anything, we have to have that all important disclaimer. Don't take advice from me on the show. I don't give you advice. I only give advice to clients I work for as a fiduciary. So until that time, think of this as helpful hints and education and talk to your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor. Because, I mean, that's just common sense. Come on. You know that. All right. Let's move on. Hey, I want to remind you to check out rockretirementclub.com. This is the premier retirement community and educational resource for you to get world-class education on how to retire from me. Resources to help you take action on that education. And maybe just as importantly or more importantly, a group of like-minded people in a similar stage of life that are proactive, intentional, wicked smart, and most of all, very nice and respectful that you can bounce ideas on and have the kind of conversations that it's really difficult to have with your neighbor or your family. So if you're interested in joining a club like that, there is a cost to it and you can check it out at rockretirementclub.com. In fact, on that homepage, you can watch a video of me walk through and give you a tour. And right below that, you can schedule a quick chat with me if you have any questions. So if you have an interest, go check that out. Well, let's move on to our hot topic segment. So before we get into our last chat with Emma about how they're going to manage in a pretty fluid situation with Luca's health situation, I wanted to bring on a friend of mine. I'm proud to call him a friend, Christopher McCluskey. He has a master's in social work, and he is president of the Professional Christian Coaching Institute. As fancy-dancy as all that is, he is probably one of the wisest men I know and sees things and has some just as he's just a wonderful man to talk to. And he and I want to talk with you about how do you frame this and move forward, which has sort of been a theme around this. So let's go talk with Chris about how do you move forward 
when life hits you a curveball, and he has some pretty good experience personally, but also professionally in helping people through this. So let's go talk with Chris. So Chris, good to have you on the show. And great to be here. Fun and exciting and a great privilege. Thanks, Raj. Uh, now, Chris is one of the wisest men that I know, and I have already set you up this way, so you have a high bar to jump over. Oh, you have. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> But we've been talking this month about, especially as baby boomers later in life, and we have these plans for our future, their spouse or our children, and life throws us curveballs, right? It can be a disease. It could be a, a relational blow up. It could be also addiction, all sorts of things that can derail our plans. And you've had some experience with that and through your counseling work. You've worked with a lot of people. How do you start to navigate that when it, it can be pretty depressing? It really can be depressing. That's for sure. Well, everybody is familiar with the concept that ultimately life is much more about how we approach it than about what happens to us. A lot of things happen to us that we can't control. And sometimes we kind of create our own messes. So we've got some responsibility. <laughs> but regardless, the mindset with which we approach whatever becomes our reality that's pretty much where the battle is won or lost. And so I spend an awful lot of time in my own life and with my clients back in the counseling years and through the coaching that I do now, spend a lot of time with them camped out in their mindsets about their current reality. Now, do you find that, like you said, some are self-inflicted mm -hmm. and others are not, but is there a period of grief and guilt over what did I do? And do some people have difficulty just moving beyond, I can't believe this happened or I did this? Well, yeah, two questions there. Yes, definitely some people have a difficulty moving beyond, beyond it. And absolutely, there is a time period of grieving. As you're trying to adapt to whatever's going to be a new normal when life has thrown you a curveball, we need to embrace a season of grieving. And that's not how we're actually wired. We are pain-avoiding creatures, pleasure-seeking, pain-avoiding creatures. So when something really hurts, we don't want to naturally go toward it. I sure don't want to embrace it. But the reality of good, healthy grieving that will allow you to move through all of the initial shock and denial and then kind of swim for a while in that soup of anger and depression, but wrestle that through to the other side of, okay, acceptance bargaining. How much do I have to accept this new? Is there any control I could exercise? Is there another way that this could turn out? You go out of that yuck of depression and anger into bargaining and acceptance, then comes new growth. So it's not just that there might be a period of grieving, there needs to be. And that's why I use the word embrace. We have to choose to move ourselves towards something we really don't want to move towards. So how do we define what is giving ourselves time to embrace versus wallowing and being stuck? <laughs> yeah, wallowing, that's a very Western notion. <laughs> in my general opinion, we Westerners, I don't care what country your listeners are in, probably they're mostly first world Western country kind of listeners. We don't do grief very well at all, in my opinion. If you go to a typical funeral, let's just take that kind of grieving there. We can all picture that everybody's coming in for the, the wake, okay, the, the, the time period with the family and all, with the, maybe the, the body laid out. And, and there is very quiet music playing in the back of the room and a little bit of sniffling here and there, right? And there's a whole lot of, shh, 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 it's okay. They're in a better place. It'll be okay. You know, life will go on. They live to go. We're, we're like reassuring each other, basically, that it's not as bad as what our self is telling us right now it is. No, I've got a, a hole the size of a cannonball through me right now. I've lost someone that means a lot to me. I want to weep and wail, but we don't. We don't, and that is not true of all cultures. That is not true of all history. You can find lots of examples of other cultures and histories where they embrace a period of grieving. They will rend their garments. They'll put on sackcloth and ashes. They will fast. They'll wear black armbands. They'll wear black clothing. What they're doing is inviting their flesh to move towards something that their spirit needs to grieve, knowing that the spirit doesn't want to. 
The flesh doesn't want to. So instead of doing what we do, which is to comfort ourselves and quiet ourselves and, oh, God forbid anybody starts to come unraveled, we'll usher them out of the room, you know. No, they hire in whalers, you know. They, they just say, let it rip. This is a huge loss. That's a testimony to the value of what's been lost. And if we will embrace it and feel it deeply together, we can also then move through it and grow from it. So that's my general bias. I don't think we do this very well. So So we tend to get stuck. Yeah. And some of that's individualistic, right? I think of when my mom passed and my sister passed, obviously a lot of sadness and everything, but sometimes I've always thought of myself feeling a little cold because I wasn't wailing and, you know, and just emoting outwardly. Right. And that's an excellent point. Yeah. We we don't want to take my metaphor or my symbol there of different styles of grieving at a wake or a funeral as indicative of exactly what our grief is supposed to look like or sound like. It's more the internal processing of it that says, well, are you actually moving through it because you're moving toward it? Or are you actually trying to hide it, stuff it, pack it away? That's the stuff that builds up and kind of comes out sideways and other things in our lives and does keep us stuck. So no, certainly not everybody needs to be weeping and wailing. I do do cry easy in sad movies though. I will say that. So in this case study with Luca and Emma, The situation is we have two people involved and Emma is healthy in her mid sixties and Luca has a terminal disease that could accelerate rapidly, uh, which has caused them to change their plans. When, when you're faced with this, we, we sort of have two parties there, right? We have the person who is looking at their mortality straight up. And then you have the spouse who is sad for the other, but also sad for what that means for their life too, which is a valid concern as well. How does someone navigate that? Yeah, that's tough. And, And you know, and I'm happy to share with your listeners that we've walked that kind of a journey. We call that decade or so of my life, the dark years. And there was a period there of about 18 months or more where every single day when, when my wife, Rachel and I would go to bed at night, uh, we'd kiss each other goodnight, and sometimes we'd say it. A lot of times we didn't. We just said it with our eyes, looking into each other's eyes, because we knew I might not be here in the morning. If I am, thank you, Lord, I got another day. And if I'm not, we had done what we could with regard to pouring into our kids and preparing our finances and, you know, my life insurance and how are the kids going to get through college and those kind of things. But living in that space of awareness that any day may be your last, and that's for me if I'm to die, and that's for Rachel because she's got a whole lot of living hopefully yet ahead of her and all those responsibilities. It was during that time period that Tim McGraw cut that out, that uh, song that everybody's so familiar with, Live Like You Were Dying. And of course, I resonated, Rachel resonated with it really strongly because the words are really good and rich for anybody going through such a tough thing, but they apply to any of us. The reality is none of us knows when our last day is going to be here, when our last breath is going to be drawn. And if we can adopt a mindset of living every single day, like we were dying, like, like, like you didn't know that tomorrow was going to be here, then that greater focus on, well, so what matters the most? What's my highest priority? Where do I need to be investing this precious gift of time and focus and energy and money, whatever resources we're bringing, where do they need to be? In some senses, going through at least a dark season like that can be a really uh, kind of a gift. It's a gift nobody wants, but, but it can be a gift because it can shift the way we not just go through such a dark season, the way we live life darkness or sun's shining bright and everything looks rosy because we never know. And boy, can we fritter away life. And whether it's a marriage or whether it's a spouse's life, I imagine you have to have that belief while you're in the midst of it, that this is the new reality and it will never go away. When potentially it could, you never know what can happen doctor wise and lifespan wise but you almost have to go that deep in re, you know what you think is reality to have that perspective brought to you. You raise a good point because I'm glad you're hesitating because there is a real delicate balance, isn't there? We, we can never, ever give in to despair. And, and so part of looking at square in the face and, as I'm saying, embracing it enough to say, well, this might be my new reality then, does say, yeah, I got to go to a place that I really don't want to go. But hope 
always needs to be alive. Hope that, you know, this may yet not be the outcome. Things could, I mean, goodness, here I am, right? 15 years after the, the entry into the dark years and many years now the other side of it. And thank you, Lord, I've got my life. And yet that shift has happened. So there's a real bringing of self to kind of the end of yourself. When, when life gets tough, like what it is here for Emma and Luca, that's not the script we write for ourselves. But of course, we don't get to write our scripts. <laughs> and so as life happens, now yeah, there's an old saying, no matter where you go, there you are. You're in the midst of it. And that again brings us back to the importance then of our mindset about it. So retaining hope and yet being willing to look the darkness square in the face, we have to evaluate, so what now? If this is the new normal, what now? What's most important? Well, then how important or dangerous is false hope? When, there, when it, there's something that's determined and barring a miracle, it's going to go a certain direction. How do you have hope? Hope, for many people anyway, is based in their spiritual worldview. I'm not calling it a religious worldview, although many have their spirituality connected with a structured religion that speaks of tenets of that faith and a moral code and those kinds of things. But whatever degree to which religion is connected with a person's spirituality, our spiritual outlook on life, the notion of, is this all there is or is there something more? Do I have an awareness of what I believe about myself as something more than just this flesh body? is, you know, electrical impulses and drawing breath, respiring, and, and, you know, is going to go back to topsoil. Is there a spirit that is me, an essence that is me? And what's the importance or value of that? If I believe that that is my true essence, my spirit, encased in the the physical body, and that it matters that I'm in this world, then my hope is not just for me, not just, I I don't want to just live X number of years and, and have them not mean anything. My hope is for something beyond me my impact on the lives of others and on the spirit in some sense of the world, at least my community, those others that I can touch. So hope has to do with a perspective on the ability to capitalize upon the influence our spirits can have during all the days that we draw breath in the physical body. It was a difficult question, I think. And I can imagine like when you were dealing with your physical issues, as you described, Mm -hmm. That part of it is outside of yourself of this was an opportunity to model for your children and for your wife how to to model for them and how you approached it. There's a lot of good that you could give them, even if it would have been the end and how you well, faced it. There was, in fact, maybe maybe a story of something that I did chose during that time would help illustrate some of, of how to hold on to hope, knowing that I hope I'm still here as here I am now, 15 years ago. Thank goodness. Years later. And, and yet I didn't know back then, but what I might not be. My wife, Rachel, and I were working on our book, When Two Become One. And obviously that's a marriage book. And it's on marital intimacy on all planes of relationship as a couple. And in writing that book, any writer knows that, you you know, there's those days where you're just staring at a blank screen, ain't nothing coming. And every single thing you write, you delete it and you start again. Okay. So it was one of those many days when I was writing that during the dark years anyway, of struggling through this illness. And my wife came into my office, saw the blank screen. She says, man, you've been at this four hours. How's it going? I'm like, not real well. She said, what's wrong? I said, there's too many people in the room. There's too many other voices in my mind, too many other people looking over my shoulder metaphorically and like criticizing what I write. And she says, sweetie, what would you say to our kids? And see, our kids were very young back then. I'm not going to be talking to my kids about a marriage book. They're, they're kids. But here I am now, 15 years later, one of my children is married already. And as the kids move toward marriage, I've got this book in hand that in that instant shifted from being a book that I was trying to write to a whole bunch of people, all of whom might criticize it. Maybe they'll read it. Maybe they want to. What am I going to write to my kids? Oh, heck, I know exactly what I would say to my kids. And my spirit felt the hope in being able to communicate at least a vision that I'd love to be here to impart to them, but I bet I won't be. Here I can put it in written form. And the book then became a beautiful expression of Rachel and I and whatever degree of wisdom we had at the time. So it was a a shift in terms of my spiritual investment in that work 
And I love the fact that now I got to give that book to our kids at their wedding and all, but you get the idea. They didn't, they didn't already that, have it? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> when we're in the middle of something and we're trying to say, I want to hold on to hope, and yet I know that I may not be here, then we can look at other vehicles, perhaps like a blog that we start or a podcast. Hello. Part of why I started podcasting was because I wanted to be able to leave my voice for my kids and my grandkids if they're going to you know, hear it down the road. Uh, what am I going to invest my money in that hopefully I can share with them, maybe a vacation home or some kind of thing, but maybe I won't. Will they still be able to enjoy it? I think in terms of looking at what your people listen to you for, investing in, quote, retirement, it's all about our hopes for a future that we all know may or may not ever materialize. Yeah. And I think Luca and Emma's journey has been very inspiring in lots of ways, just their attitude and and you can tell that she is leaning into leaning into that. And I think of it uh, physically as when lemons rain down upon you or the curveball hits you in the face, you're sort of back on your heels. And that's part of the grieving process. Well, maybe the grieving process is really going from on your heels to back on your toes. That's right. That's right. That's right? what will get you back on your toes and, and start working on a new normal. Uh-huh. Yeah. So like an example with Emma and Luca is... You know, he physically doesn't have the energy to mountain bike, and that's one of their passions. Well, he has an electric mountain bike. And, Love it. But that's just one little example I think of, well, what can I do rather than what you've grieved once you've grieved of what you may not be able to do anymore? I imagine that's a lot of it. It absolutely is. Man, I can remember the days where I chose each day. Do I take a shower and shave today or can I ignore those and use the little bit of energy I'm trying to steward for some other things and I'll, you know, I'll take care of the other. Like, like you're literally measuring out, not time management, energy management. <laughs> What's going to get done? It actually can be a tremendously valuable thing. Again, a gift you would never want. But because we're in tough things like what Emma and Luca are, when we look at them still in a spirit of hope and say, what could be, what could I still do? Sometimes things that never would have materialized otherwise actually happen. I'll give another example. I've got a small business incubator that I run now that my children and their peers are benefiting from in launching their businesses as they're in their 20s now, okay? I don't know that I ever would have poured the energy into that had I thought that I would just be better off, you know, continue to build the business I've got because, you know, someday the kids will inherit it. I don't know whether my kids will want this business, but I know they'll be interested in business. They're going to have to make a living somehow. Entrepreneurism is attractive. So what if I were to put some of my energy into an entrepreneurial incubator and help them have that structure? So yeah, I, I love that. And an electric mountain bike, I didn't even know there was such a thing. It's like a moped, huh? Well, yeah, you can just hit a button and it goes. It's awesome. Wow. Um, well, it goes back to one of those. And I guess you have to intentionally go through the grieving process in order to get to the point of a question that one of our friends throws out every now and then of, well, what does this make possible? Or what can I do next? Yes. And if you don't get through the grieving process, it's a horrible question. <laughs> Great. You it don't is, want to hear it. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause the answer is nothing, right? I'm just Leave me stuck alone. here Leave me in, alone. In, in the darkness. Yeah. In the despair. Yes. And again, back to, again, the word of mindset, those kinds of questions, those kind of hope filled possibility type questions. What does this make possible? What else could I do? Those come out of a mindset that is chosen that really can only be embraced when you move through the grieving to say, okay, didn't want this in the script, but here it is. So what's next? Well, I don't know. What does this make possible? So I want to pivot briefly to, in this case, it could be the spouse or the child that is walking with the other spouse, dealing with whatever. So you have one is the person that's dealing with it. Usually when we're in those modes, we're very inward focused. You could call it selfish. Because we're working on ourselves and selfish sucks on a partner. Yeah. Right. And then you're also dealing with your own emotions and your own grieving of a different sort, but you're supposed to be the supporter of that person and pick up the slack. How do they navigate something like this? 
Well, you know, we ought to have my wife on here because she would sure anybody who's walked that journey would be able to speak to it better than, than I am able. Because I'll be the first to admit, if you're going to go through something horrible, most of us, if we've got any serious maturity about it, are going to say, well, let it happen to me. I, I don't want it to happen to my kids. I don't want it to happen to my spouse or anybody I love. So if it's got to be bad, let it happen to me. But for all the others who have to then be around and watch you deteriorate or watch you struggle or figure out how to help or cope with your angry outbursts or your irritability because you're so on your last ragged nerve or whatever, I think their challenges are every bit, if not more, difficult because they're also trying to look toward their new normal, which is not the lights go out and whatever the next life is, but instead, how are we ever going to go on without this loved one in our lives? How will we meet our financial needs? For some people, that's the question, but what will fill our days? Am I going to remarry again? I can't even think about it. They can't go there. So it can put them in a kind of a limbo state, a, a perpetual grieving yeah, I'm not sure I have immediate insights on that side of the equation that, that I guess it's Emma here is is kind of having to live out near like I do being on the side of, of the one who was passing. Yeah. I mean, we all have to do it to some extent. I think it's somewhat similar. I think, I think number one would be you have to protect yourself first, save yourself first because it's easy to sacrifice yourself emotionally, physically, everything, and then become drained and not helpful to anybody, including yourself. Now, Roger, that's a really good point because it's not only easy to do that, to sacrifice yourself. And I think it's extremely hard not to. If any of us are actually loving, decent human beings, you, you hear, you know, well, save yourself first. And it's like, eh, nope, <laughs> not, not going to do that. I'll put my dreams and my hopes and my wants and all behind me. And I'm just going to take care because after all, they're dying. So I think it's very hard to do self-care. I will tell you, for example, that Rachel and I now, in this season of our marriage, been married 33 years now, we are actually now, because I'm so far outside of the scary time, it's, it's so obvious that unless I get hit by a bus tomorrow or something, I'm, I'm going to be here for a long time yet. She's actually still discovering some of the anger and depression and stuckness or frustration, like, like some of the yucky emotion that she wasn't about to let herself express back then because it would only drain me further, make me feel guilty for being sick or something. So interesting. Yeah. yeah I could see that happening too. Yeah. Chris, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. You are mm. just a joy to talk to. Well, as I said, this has been a privilege, my friend, I would be happy to do this at any point, And I hope that your listeners recognize the value of what they're getting from Rocket Retirement. This is just a, a beautiful thing you're doing here, Raj. All right, with all best laid plans, in this last session with Emma, we're going to talk about what are some of the things you're excited about? What are some of the things you're worried about and how they're going to manage dealing with a situation that can change very quickly in lots of different directions. So let's go have that conversation with Emma. And then from here, we'll have that results webinar on October 10th. Hello, Emma. Hello. How are you today? It's so easy to use this name because that's how I address my daughter. <laughs> I can that's it. so nice. It makes I me love th that. it makes me think of all the Emma songs and things like that that, that I will not sing to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> so this is our last chat on the show. And then on October 10th, we're gonna be live, no faces, but mm -hmm. we'll walk through all of the information that you gave and look for insights on your situation and maybe think of some things for you to consider. So I figured we'd take this last session, I guess we'll call it, mm -hmm. and just talk about just some general things I was wondering. And, you know, obviously there's so much going on. The first off is when you think of a support network, how close is family to you? Well, uh, geographically, my family's not close at all. Um, I have a brother who 
uses this as his home base. However, he travels about 11 and a half months out of the year. So that's not really a home. And however, I do have a sister that I'm very, very close to and consider that to be a a pretty solid support. Because I know I've had clients later in life that have ended up moving towards that built-in social network because you're helping Luca through his Mm -hmm. journey. And then there's always the possibility that you fall on your mountain bike, Mm -hmm. break your shoulder, have to deal Mm -hmm. with your own calamities of sort. And what, what would, who would pick up the baton? Do you have sort of an action plan for something like that? Right. And in that case, then there would be it's certain friends and stuff that we have in the area. And then also um, one of the things that's been extremely beneficial to us is that we have the best neighbor on the planet. <laughs> so that's been really helpful, especially during summer months when Luke has been ill and can't mow the lawn you know, and he is a perfectionist. So having another perfectionist do that for him has been incredibly helpful. That so. That's an interesting point because it's not just having someone help with the lawn, but someone that does it to his standard. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I, I've uh, experienced that with lots of people who end up in a situation where there are certain things that they need someone to then do for them. And it's very personalized. I've always wondered how, you know, home care type places, you know, really manage all that because everyone has such, not just such different needs, you know, they might need uh, help around the house, but they also have such different personalities. Yeah, because you have the need is sort of twofold, right? It's the actual task, mowing Mm -hmm. the lawn, then there's the, you know, the spirit in which it's mowed, which may mm-hmm. sound, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, because it could almost be a bigger annoyance if it was someone that was not as detailed mowing it. It could, it yes. could be a stressor. Yeah, so it would be a stressor, especially for Luca, who is an incredible doer. Doing is a lot of how he defines himself, and I've learned an awful lot through this process and really realized how hard it must be for people who are unable to perform the things that, that they love to do. I think of people that are in uh, assisted living or nursing homes who can no longer say garden or something like that. And they're doers. That's, it takes away some of the identity of who they are. Yeah. And I know Luca is pretty functional. It's just, ebbs and flows. So how has he managed that? He has, he's had a really hard time during those periods when he cannot do, you know, when he was in uh, chemotherapy and one of the side effects was that his feet got really red and blistered to the point where he couldn't hardly walk. And so him doing things that was, you know, in a different time of the year and stuff, being able to use the snowblower, that sort of thing. It was really hard on him not being able to do that. Do you find yourself sort of in the coach role of helping keep perspective or I'm assuming some people act out angrily, others solemnly. Then again, that's each person's different, right? It is. Each person is different. And I think that, That's one of the big things that I think is really challenging for especially couples that are in this situation because you want to help as much as possible. However, there's a line and I kind of look at it like uh, when my son was in puberty, I couldn't figure out sometimes that day, was he going to be a little boy or was he going to be a man, right? (laughs) You know, treat me differently, right? Because I woke up in a different. So I think the negotiation between couples of how much to do and when, and 
all of that is a very, very big part of this. Why well, I can think of even healthy couples as you get older, it's like, don't, I can do that. Leave me alone. You know, that, <laughs> I, I can hear myself saying that. I can't recall the exact situation. And I imagine that's just magnified mm-hmm. when you're dealing with this. So how do you manage that? It sounds like you got a great spirit and you get it. So how do you manage that for you? Well, I manage that through a lot of support systems that I have in the background. In the, I would say, more intense times, uh, we've taken advantage of our uh, health system has had uh, palliative care and those kinds of things that they are there not only for the patient, but also for the caretaker or the family members. You have to really learn how to advocate to get your own support. And you also have to, I've had to really say, okay, that's enough for now. I need to separate myself from the situation so I can have a little space and try to take care of myself. Well, and that that was where I was going is it's easy to sacrifice yourself, especially when it's someone else that you love, right? Mm -hmm. And it's also easy to feel guilty of, I still want to live. I still want to go ride my bike and, you know, and, it, it can feel selfish, but it, it's not really. Yeah, it can feel really selfish. And I did, you know, really struggle with that, especially during the times when he was in a lot of, you know, more intense treatment or recovery from surgery or, you know, things like that. So, so I had to learn ways to make that work for me. So were you able to get past, I can go do, I'm just going to use riding a bike. I don't know if you did that, but yeah. I can use... I am not being selfish by going to do X, ride my bike, because it's a mental uh, area you can process and decompress for yourself. Exactly. Exactly. And so then I was able to set aside a, you know, a certain amount of time and make it, you know, like an appointment. It was much better for him and for us, for me to announce that ahead of time and say, you know, on Tuesday, blah, 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 at this time, I'll be gone for an hour and a half or two hours, or, you know, this is how you can reach me, you know, that type of thing. Going from here, you've rearranged your life to an extent. I'm talking about both of you to embrace things, to, he had, you know, to go drive the RV, to mm-hmm. ride bikes, to experience things that the two of you enjoyed anyway, but you sort of accelerated that and focused on that because of everything going on. In your mind, what, you're sitting here, what could go wrong, whether it's financially or what could go wrong with this plan? Yeah, I do think a lot about you know what could go wrong with this because one, we could take that to another level of, well, you know, we need to experience it now because we don't know how much time we have, or we, I call it, we don't know how much good time that we have because a person might live a long time, but they may not have the ability to have experiences during a lot of that. So sometimes I think, oh, it's very easy to make financial decisions that are based on that, that are maybe not best for our long-term plan whether he lives through this or he does not. The other thing that can go wrong is that, like you mentioned earlier, something could happen to me. One of the things that I do think about also is having huge expenses that we had not planned on. For instance, several of the people that I know that have had this particular cancer have ended up in you know, they wanted to have clinical trials, you know, it recurred, they wanted clinical trials, or they wanted some treatment that was not covered by insurance that cost easily $50,000 and more. That's a good point, because then there's that. And then there's no guarantee, you don't know quality of life afterwards, all of those things start to come into the calculus, right? Yes. 
What would you like clarity on through this process? And obviously on October 10th, we're going to go through it somewhat publicly, but it will be more just looking, not, you know, looking for risks and opportunities that might not be readily apparent. And then obviously we're going to do some things privately as a thank you. What would you like clarity on through a process like this? One of the things that would help me with clarity is kind of, you know, doing this whole process in an agile way, but always keeping in mind there's only so many resources. There's only so much time, whether it's for me or it's for him, that it doesn't feel like there's enough clarity on, you know, knowing where to step next. Uh, that's pretty clear. You know, we have a certain lifestyle and stuff at this particular time, and we have a very set set of you know, medical resources and stuff in our community. However, that gets a little cloudy once you go a certain number of months because months are very essential in this. And I was looking at a um, one of the bills that came in earlier this year for a treatment. And, you know, luckily we have insurance. It was $100,000. And... So looking down the pike saying, you know, just getting a little more clarity on what are the adventures and stuff that we really want to take, but also fit into what would be a good way to approach this uncertain time. Yeah. And then you have the political risk of they change Medicare rules in some way. and Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. okay. We'll, we'll work on doing that, creating some clarity. I'm reading a book right now called Thinking in Bets <laughs> by Annie Duke, a famous oh. poker player. It's a really good book, but it makes me think of this agile process and some of the things that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we think of our longer term strategy as chess, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. she makes a really good point of chess is actually a very deterministic game. You can figure out exactly what the moves should be mathematically and strategically. Right. And and as she was talking about poker is, and I think this applies to what you're talking about is all of these decisions we make Mm -hmm. like poker, we make with incomplete information Mm -hmm. and a very dynamic situation, right? Things can pop into the game or pop out of the game. Yes. And we never have all the information to actually mathematically get the right answer. So there really isn't a right answer. You don't know until after the fact, which is not comforting. And so we'll make sure we address that in our work and then on the uh, results show of how do you, if you always have complete information, how do you find a rhythm to keep looking for new information and assessing? Because that's really all we have, right? Yeah, that really is all we have, no matter whether you're dealing with serious illness or disability or or not. But uh, it does it does feel as if the bet is, I don't know, the stakes are higher, I guess. I guess the it, it feels as if the stakes are higher. There isn't a redo. There's no the redo. Time. Once you're all in on something, sometimes you can't pull them back off, right? If, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's the reason why I didn't join the military. Yeah. You can't. There's not no optionality once you there's sign. There's no. Yeah. Unless you, yeah, there's, you know. There's no I quit. I was trying to think of the guy in MASH who was trying to get out with a Section 8. What was his name? Uh, <laughs> you know, you can try to work oh, the system. Yeah. <laughs> And I think a lot of it comes down to systems of processing information and just making lots of little good decisions. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we'll we'll make sure that we focus on that. Anything else that you want clarity on from a, we'll just say from a financial standpoint? I think the other thing from a financial standpoint that I really want clarity on is looking at things. Okay, I'm a widow within a year. I'm a widow within five years. 
you know, what are those different options that I have and what would those look like? Uh, I'm not the person who's going to, you know, move to Africa tomorrow or, or change my lifestyle that much. But still, I think getting some more clarity around that. That's good. And we, and I think that was one of the, the setups early on was we sort of have these parallel tracks we need to model mm-hmm. to plan for. I have somewhat off subject question mm-hmm. is how do you define yourself? Who are you? Oh, that's an interesting question because I'm working on this uh, journaling project right now. And I realized that I've always ever since I was a little kid, been incredibly focused on who I am. And I've had to redefine that again, a little bit more as I left my quote unquote, for, you know, 40 hour work life, you know, which was normally 70, but only if you're on salary, does it work that way? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. And who I define myself as is, is somebody who's just continually learning, you know, very, very curious, always wanting to, you know, know more and expand, you know, my horizons, find, find new ways to express myself and, and also make new connections. That's, that's going to be a big part of this part of my life. I absolutely love that. Oh, good. <laughs> and one of the reasons I love that is because I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Last month we had the whole series of Who Are You? Yeah. The reason I love that is because I didn't hear the labels, right? There's the work label. I'm a VP of blah, blah, blah. But I didn't hear I'm a caregiver. I'm a cyclist. I didn't hear those labels because they can replace the work label. But then... Mm-hmm those labels can go away, right? What if you could not cycle anymore? Well, then you're not a cyclist. Yeah. But everything you expressed, you could, as who you are, you can do regardless of your physical situation or circumstance, right? You can always always make more connections, sick or not legless or not, you can always do a lot of the things you, you just said. And I think that's a really healthy way to define it. So it made my heart happy. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I've had to, I've had some of those defining moments and sometimes I've looked at people that are complaining about what I judge as small things. And I'm like, not enough near death experiences. Uh, a few years back, I was hit by a car on my bicycle, and it was another time of reevaluation. What if I couldn't ride my bicycle? You know, so that's not really who I am. It's just a part of of how I express myself. Now, you said you've thought of this naturally for most of your life. Mm-hmm. Did this way of defining yourself? always be there or did some of the near death things, the bicycle, what's happening with Luca, did those things help shift it a little bit or just accelerate it? Yeah. I think that they helped shift it some, but really accelerate it to really define what is the essential, essential part, you know, that still remains. What am I, if I am not that kind of thing. So would you say that the dirty trick in life is to have it accelerated without having to go through being hit by a car or to (laughs) have someone you love have cancer? The trick is to be able to think that way and have that urgency without the actual event. Yes. Yes. I have frequently said that, you know, they're using virtual reality now a lot. And I frequently said it would be nice for people to have that uh, virtual reality experience without having to have the consequences of it, say, on their body or something, but moving them to another arena of saying, hey, this is what's really important. And I wonder, Emma, if there has to be some consistency in it. Cause I think of when nine 11 happened, 
right? Yes. Which is a horrible thing to, you know, I'm here, I'm here, I was in Addison, Texas, and mm-hmm. I was working at a major firm, and I remember when it happened that in most of the day I was in the office watching all of the coverage with some colleagues, and then I think about one o'clock in the afternoon, I remember this, and I lived about 50, about an hour away from home. And I remember mm-hmm. this sudden urge of being home. Yes. And so I went and I was home. And then we had this period where those priorities that you talk about of what you really care about were front and center. Yes. But then they sort of fade away and you get back into your rhythm. I wonder, even with your virtual virtual reality system, you almost have to keep re-upping that perspective because the world will suck you into their priorities without you realizing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. It does. I think that it does suck you back in. And also because not enough time is spent just doing nothing, just paying attention so it's very, very easy to get sucked down the rabbit hole. Well, I want to thank you on behalf of everyone for being willing to have these conversations so publicly. Oh, you're welcome. Um, they've meant a lot to me, and I think they have to a lot of other people. Yeah, yeah, I really, uh, really have, really have enjoyed this, and and I hope it's helpful. And then I'm excited to hang with you on October 10th to sort of go through it in a formal financial way. And then yeah. hopefully we can have some insights to help you a little bit on your journey. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, that'll be fun. Hey, welcome to the Happy Lab, where we noodle on how to live a happier life. (sighs) You know, one thing that makes me happy as I think and reflect on this month with Emma and you walking through this case study, hearing Emma and how she talks about her life and how she talks about how Luca manages things, and it's a roller coaster for sure, but one thing that has made me really happy is her spirit through all of this. And I think that is critically important when you're going through something is to have that, you know, you're going to have low points for sure, but to have go through those stages and to come out with a spirit like she has, has made me really happy and made me feel, I don't know if resilient, brave is the word, you know, I reflect the difficult times for myself of it's good to have people around you that can speak perspective to you so we don't get too down and we don't get too high, too. And that's made me happy just hearing her. It's 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 beautiful. Hopefully it's made you happy, too. On your marks, get set. And we're off to set a seven day goal to take a baby step to live a great life. Rock retirement, right? All right. In the next seven days, here's what I would like you to do. When you receive six shots Saturday, this Saturday or the next Saturday, reply with a message to Emma and Luca. It could be good luck. It could be anything you want. I have no doubt it will be kind and encouraging or thoughtful. And I'll compile all of those and I will share them with her and Luca. And I think that would be a cool thing to do. So when you get six shots Saturday, send them a message and I'll put them all together and share them with them. All right. For extra credit, why don't you go share this show with a friend that you think needs to hear what we talk about. Maybe it's just the show in general, or maybe it's this series, but that is really the only way people find out about the show. I don't really market much. I think I just like to sit here and hang with you and talk about noodle on how to rock retirement, but there may be somebody, you know, that needs a show like this. So go share it with them. All right. 
until next week, we get to dive into tax management in retirement. I didn't even preview that. So lucky you, you get to hang out. You heard all of October, we're focused on tax management in retirement. Talk about a 180, but it's an important topic too. Talk to you next month. Be well. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of Retirement Answer Man. Be sure to visit rogerwhitney.com slash answers to access the Retirement Answer Library with over 30 checklists to help you make the most of the only life you have. Remember, you have more power than you realize to create an amazing life starting today with Retirement Answer Man. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Have a wonderful day.